We're really pleased to have you here tonight to hear Eugenie Scott speak. Eugenie was the executive director of the Center for Science Education, and throughout her career, she's been advocating for ensuring that scientifically proven topics that have become controversial within the public remain in schools. And something that is really great about Eugenie is she's had a career doing this work for quite some time. So while it's really on our minds a lot right now, Eugenie knows that it's been an issue for a really long time and can speak to that as well as the research behind why this is happening. So without further ado, oh, I always forget about the ado, which is turn off your phone, please. And if you need to use the restroom, you can go back through the door you used, head towards the center of the museum where you purchase your tickets and the restrooms on your left and otherwise. Eugenie. We, we have been, my husband and I have been members of the Exploratorium since the flood. I mean, this is a wonderful organization. If you're not a member yet, join, because they're fabulous here. As Kathleen said, I used to work for the National Center for Science Education. Our mission is to defend the teaching of evolution and climate science in the public schools. So as a result, yes, thank you. <laughs> it is a righteous organization. So as a result, I have spent decades uh, dealing with people who reject what scientists consider to be perfectly reasonable science, well-supported science, well-accepted in the scientific community, but you know, people just say, no, we don't believe it. Although we don't actually use the word belief at the National Center for Science Education because science isn't a belief. It's not a, it's not a philosophical system. It's a really great way of finding out about the natural world. And that's what scientists do. So I've been curious about why people deny good science for quite a long time and uh, the the really wonderful thing is that there's a lot of research on this topic. And what is even better is that the research really reinforces all of my um, uh, uh, anecdotal <laughs> understanding of this topic, which is what we all like. But you, you really can't depend upon that. That's, that's actually not the, the way to go. There are a lot of things people get wrong, OK? Um, do you all know that old Woody Allen joke I've taken the Evelyn Woods Reading Dynamics course. In three hours, I read War and Peace. It's about Russia. <clears throat> People believe that eyewitness accounts are really accurate. They believe that we only use 10% of our brains and a whole lot of other things that just aren't true. But for a lot of things that people believe that just aren't true, you can provide them with information and with evidence. And oh, they changed their mind. Gee, I thought photosynthesis resulted in the release of carbon dioxide. No, it's oxygen. OK, people can change their mind about a lot of things. Then there's a whole lot of other things that people are wrong about which do not seem to be very susceptible <laughs> to changing with new information. The 9-11 truthers, creationists, climate change um, uh, skeptics, aficionados of the moon uh, landing being a hoax, all of these, providing more accurate information doesn't seem to change their opinions or the rejection of erroneous views. So there seem to be some ideas that we can change our minds about and other ideas that we seem to be very resistant to. So why do we have this kind of knowledge resistance? Well, maybe the 9-11 truth truthers and the creationists and people who think Trump's inauguration crowd pictures were faked are just dumb. Maybe these people are just unintelligent. Well, I can assure you that that has not been my experience in dealing with creationists. They're not stupid. They're not unintelligent. They have a very different understanding of science than I do, but these people are not dumb, and I don't think climate change uh, contrarians are also stupid. I, I don't think it's a matter of just stupidity. Well, maybe they're ignorant. There's a difference, right? One of these is curable. Um, <laughs> if they're ignorant, maybe if we provide them with more information, they'll see the light and they'll agree with scientists and this problem will be over. This is known as the information definite, uh, excuse me, the information deficit explanation. And for a very long time, the, all through the 80s and 90s and even part of the 2000s, this was kind of the received wisdom. Well, we just have to do a better job with science education. 
We just have to get the information out there and then the scales will fall from people's eyes and everything will be just fine. The classic research on this uh, is a study from 2011 by McCrighton Dunlap. They looked at Gallup data on attitudes toward climate change. And of course, Gallup collects the usual demographic age and sex and political affiliation and so forth and so on. They found that conservative white males were the least likely to accept anthropogenic climate change, but that's been shown by a lot of other studies as well. But they also looked at something else, which was how confident did people feel about their knowledge of climate change. They found that white males who were most confident in their knowledge of climate change were the most negative about it. For the question, global warming will never happen, 48% of the most confident white males rejected climate change. 19% of the less confident white males rejected it, but only 7% of the general adult population rejected climate change during, at this study. Similar results were found for the question of whether climate change is anthropogenic. 71% of the most confident agreed, 52% of the less confident agreed, and only 31% of the general male population agreed. So when you look at data like these, it implies that the more knowledge you have, the less likely you are to accept uh, a scientific point of view. And there have been a lot of, I mean, obviously this is self-reported data, these were people who said they knew a lot about climate change, maybe they really didn't. Uh, but there are other surveys where they actually gave people a test of scientific knowledge and then look at the results. And the results are really quite mixed along these lines. Um, some of you may, how many of you have heard of the backfire effect? Is that something that people have run into? Yeah. Interestingly enough, there's some papers now, uh, I'm not gonna go into it, but just for you who raised your hands and are interested in this, there's some papers out, and there's a, a very good paper, which is a, a survey of a number of studies, looking at the backfire effect, and it's not as firmly entrenched as some people formerly believed it was. Now, there, seem to be other factors at work in the acceptance or rejection of a scientific idea than just how much information you have about it, how much knowledge you have about it. Knowledge of science, I would like you to consider, is necessary but not sufficient when it comes to understanding a scientific idea and accepting the view that scientists accept. Well, maybe knowledge resistors just hate science. How many of you think that Americans are anti-scientific? Several of you, not not a uh, not half of you, but at least a third of you have raised your hands. There, we actually have a lot of evidence about this question of Americans' attitudes toward science. The Pew Research Center data on adult Americans show that a majority of Americans believe science has a mostly positive effect on um, society, and only four percent, that little orange sliver there, believe that science is mostly negative. Similarly, Americans trust scientists to be reliable sources of information on important issues. So the measles, mumps, and uh, rubella vaccine, the causes of climate change, GMO foods, the public is much more likely to go to a scientist for information on this than they are to a politician, say, or the press. Elected officials, you notice, are way on the bottom there for <laughs> all of these. In this 2014 Harris poll on occupations and prestige, scientists are right up there with doctors, firemen, and the military as high prestige occupations. They like us out there, guys. Perhaps even more important, when, when parents are asked, would you like your child to grow up to be a doctor, lawyer, merchant, thief? Um, scientists are right up there with doctors and engineers. So, there doesn't appear to be a really strong anti-science feeling in the United States public. Um, there are a lot of polls like this showing that we actually like science a lot. We particularly like medical science. We really like uh, the technology that science gives us. Turn off your cell phones. Um, there's, um, th there's a lot of evidence that we really like science, but there are a lot of people who don't like this science or that science. So they don't like evolution, or somebody else doesn't like climate change, or somebody else is really suspicious about GMOs. Not liking this science or that science or science ABC 
is not the same as having a negative attitude towards science per se. Creationists love science. They want their kids to study science. They just have kind of a funny definition of what science is, but that's another talk. So how do you explain knowledge resistance? Well, they're not stupid, they're not ignorant, and they don't hate science, so what is it? There's a lot of overlapping concepts floating around in the cognitive psychology literature. For our cultural cognition, confirmation bias, so forth and so on, for our purposes, they all refer in some way to viewing factual information through a filter. It's an ideological filter, a values filter, a group identification filter, or all three of the above, or some are, some all are, or, or sometimes none. Values and ideologies are shared by groups, so these are interacting, features, interacting factors, certainly. <clears throat> Values and uh, ideologies become part of the identification that we have in the groups that we form tribes with, shall we say. Um, we can change our minds pretty easily about speed reading or whether we use 10% of our brain, but it's a lot harder to change our mind when changing our minds about something requires a, a readjustment or an attack upon our ideology or our values or our group identification. So it's not everything that people have trouble changing their minds about when it comes to science knowledge resistance, but it's those things that have consequences for values and ideologies that they hold very important. Let me say a word about ideology because as in the cartoon, ideology is presented as this terrible, terrible thing that is contrasted with science, and science is good, therefore ideology is bad. Um, I have a different understanding of ideology. To me, ideology is not an instant negative. I look at the word ideology like I would look at the word operation, okay? An appendectomy and a lobotomy are both operations, right? There's one of them I don't want to have. The other I had, I'll let you guess which of the two it is. But there are ideologies that are destructive and injurious, and there are ideologies that are beneficial and fulfilling. It's like an operation. There's good and there's bad. You can't just lump and say, oh, all ideology is bad, because everybody has ideologies. Our isms reflect and to some degree determine what is important with us. And each of us is going to be a mixture of ideologies. You can be a feminist, humanist, environmentalist. I know a lot of people who are like that. Um, the isms are ideologies reflecting what we consider important. And values are part of being a human being. They govern our interactions. You know, we're social primates, right? We live in groups, we identify with other people, we form tribes holding mutual values and interests, we embrace the groups that share our ideologies. The skeptics are an, a, a group. Um, scientists are very diffuse, but um, nonetheless, sometimes you can identify even as a scientist. So when I talk about people being motivated by ideologies, I don't, I'm not saying that's a bad thing necessarily. The problem in both science and everyday life is when an ideological position prevents somebody from considering empirical evidence that might conflict with the val values or the ideologies. Overcoming that very human tendency is some, one of the hardest things that we have to do, and most people don't do it very well. Ask a liberal about um, about uh, nuclear uh, energy generation. Um, so let's look at how ideologies, values, and identification can affect knowledge resistance. Now working with some ide You can't hear me? All right, well I will stand closer to the mic then. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I always worry that I'm bellowing and so I'm, I'm thank you for telling me that. This is much better. Um, Working with some ideas from the anthropologist Mary Douglas, Dan Kahan and his colleagues at the Yale Cultural Cognition Laboratory suggested that people can be placed on two axes that I think are kind of useful. Uh, there is an individualist communitarian axis and a cross-cutting hierarchical egalitarian axis. Now everybody is someplace among these various quadrants. Um, 
these axes can be loosely associated with political parties and, and other groupings as well, of course. So for example, Republicans are more likely to be hierarchical and individualistic. Democrats are more likely to be egalitarian and communitarian. Libertarians are egalitarian individualists. And I didn't know that their symbol was the porcupine either, but somehow it fits. <laughs> and although it's, it's not a political party, um, I would say that evangelical Christians are a very good example of hierarchical communitarians. And again, this is not a political party, but in terms of the values that they share. Now, these axes are associated with different opinions about social issues. So hierarchical individualists don't worry very much about climate change, nanotechnology, or guns, but they're very concerned about gun control. Diagonal to them, the egalitarian communitarians worry a lot about climate change, nanotechnology, and guns, but they're rather positive about gun control. And differences occur between the other two diagonals as well. Now these concerns reflect values and ideologies as well as identities with groups. An individualist egalitarian in the lower left there who feels very strongly about involuntary mental health treatment is going to be resistant to information that promotes that practice. Such information is going to threaten libertarian values and also potentially cause a rift with other libertarians, which is the tribe. And so such information is likely to be rejected. Kahan and colleagues surveyed people about how much risk they associated with global warming, which is the green line, gun ownership, the red line, marijuana legalization, which is the blue line there, and vaccination, which is the black line running through the middle. Liberals were very concerned about global warming and gun ownership. You can see the green and the red line is very high there. Uh, but they weren't particularly concerned about marijuana legalization. This was not a high-risk thing for them. And conservative Republicans were exactly the opposite. They were uh, not very concerned about um, uh, you know, climate change and guns, um, but they were really concerned about marijuana legalization. Interestingly enough, childhood vaccinations really didn't track by party, which is kind of interesting, but that's another discussion. So, okay, given that people hold values related to an issue, can you change the opinions? Can you take some of those um, uh, egalitarian communitarians and, and change their opinion on this on that view? How does the knowledge deficit idea, how does the idea of just presenting more information work? Well, there have been some studies on this as well. And please don't think that Dan Kahan and the Yale group are the only people doing research in this area. There's other groups doing work as well. It's just that he has really interesting studies and they, they have good graphics, so they make uh, good topics for talks like this one. Um, in another study, Kahan and his colleagues tested a sample of adult Americans on numeracy. In other words, are you good at math? Some people are, some people aren't. I have to take off my shoes if I go beyond 10, but uh, people you know, can start, uh, score differently. But they also collected information on political leanings as well as attitudes about these social issues. So the subjects were asked to evaluate a study of the efficacy of a skin cream for treating rashes. So they were asked to evaluate a, basically a two by two table. Some people got the skin cream, some did not. Some got better, some got worse. You got the general drift here, right? Okay, very typical two by two kind of table. And then they were asked to decide whether using the skin cream is more likely to make the rash get better or get worse. Okay, so you can look at those numbers and you can think about that. Now predictably, as expected, the more numerate uh, people who had better numeracy scores did better on this than other people did. Um, for, but nobody did terribly well. For part of the sample, uh, the correct answer was that the rash got worse, and for another part of the sample, the correct answer was that the rash got better. But they used the same numbers for the cells in both, measure, in both treatments. They just changed the column headings. See how they did that? It's the same numbers in both tables. They just, you know, f the correct answer is, is you know, the, the rash got worse in one group, the correct answer is that it got better in the other. So the num this wasn't a real thing. But then they changed it up a bit, and they asked a question about whether gun control has a positive or negative effect on crime. If you ban concealed weapons, does this increase or decrease crime? 
And as with the hand cream, they jiggered the column headings, so part of the sample got one correct answer, like you can see there, that crime decreases. Another part of the sample got another correct answer, which was D, that the crime increases. But the numbers are the same, okay? Alas, most of the sample did pretty poorly on either the skin cream, uh, which is the, on the left side, or the gun control. You can see the numbers are pretty crummy for, you know, one through about five or starts getting a little better for the seven, eight, nine. The people who are more numerate did better on the rash example, and they also did better on the crime example. Um, but when they factored in political identification, things got a little more interesting. The top picture is the skin cream example, and recall that rash increases or rash decreases can both be correct answers depending on you know, what part of the sample you got, what, what the column headings were. And the re here the results are separated by party affiliation, blue for liberal Democrats, red for conservative Republicans. And again, the more numerate um, uh, did better than the, than the less numerate. And party affiliation really didn't make any difference when it came to skin cream. People did equally poorly or well, regardless of whether they were Democrats or Republicans. But it's a little different when you factor in party. Democrats largely believe that crime decreases when guns are restricted, and when that's the correct answer, they're more likely to get it right. And when crime increases is the correct answer, they're more likely to get it wrong, which fits their ideology. Similarly, Republicans are more likely to get correct that crime increases when you restrict guns and less likely to get it right when the correct answer is crime decreases, which is ideologically less attractive. And notice that having greater numeracy doesn't make you more likely to get it right if the correct answer doesn't fit your ideology. I think this is such a great study. I really, you've, it just makes your head explode, it really does. Now there are lots of studies like these showing that values, ideology, and group identification tend to trump empirical evidence. And in 20 minutes I don't have a lot of time to give you more examples, but the literature really is full of them. My personal experience dealing with creationism and climate change, uh, as I say, underscores these conclusions. Yes? Can I ask you, by creationism, you mention creation denialism? Correct. Yes, I am. I was using shorthand. When I'm, um, and thank you for that. Uh, his, his point was that there's creationists and there's creationists. And there are some people who call themselves creationists who believe God created, but believe he created through the process of evolution. Those people are evolutionists in my book. And they generally don't call themselves creationists. The people who self-identify as creationists are usually biblical literalists, young earth creationists who sees that example. But yes, I agree with you. <clears throat> in terms of creationism, my experience has been, and others have actually done research to show this, but that conservative Christian um, ideology of biblical literalism is the major barrier to the acceptance of evolution for conservative Christians. And for the acceptance of anthropogenic climate change, the values of personal responsibility, small government, a strong military, the importance of capitalism, and identification as a Republican, recently if not historically, are prime inhibitors for acceptance of anthropogenic global warming. So what are we gonna do about this? Well, I do have some ideas. First suggestion for coping with knowledge resistance is to distinguish between opinion and fact and think about what can we say about something from the standpoint of science and what can we say from the standpoint of opinion. We like to think that our opinions, that we would like to think that science and factual and empirical information inform our opinions. But opinions, as, I, as my little riff on ideology, opinions are a great deal more than just fact. <clears throat> There are a lot of things that we have opinions about. What to do about the healthcare crisis? Uh, what to do about uh, the current uh, crises in the Middle East? What to do about the immigration uh, problems that we're having in this country? Uh, what to do about gun violence? Or what to do about uh, climate change and vaccination? There are a lot of things that we have opinions about. 
that go beyond what the empirical evidence, what the science might say about those particular subjects. Because if you're talking about immigration, you have values about um, uh, the need for, um, I, I don't assume that you have this value, but you might hold a value about the need for dignity of somebody emigrating to this country. So what do we do with these people? Do we put them uh, in jail or do we give them a, um, a, a medical card like they do in Canada? I mean, our values, our values will very much influence what we will decide to do about many of these things about which we need to make decisions in our society. Opinions should hopefully be informed by empirical and factual information, but they're not generally determined by science or fact. But opinions should not be confused with whether the earth goes around the sun or the sun grows around the earth, whether living things have descended with modification from common ancestors, with whether CO2 is a warming gas. There are a lot of things that are pretty much just settled science and are not a matter of opinion. To a certain degree, a young earth creationist believes that descent with modification, common ancestry of living things, is an opinion. But it's not an opinion. It is something for which there is a tremendous amount of factual information. And similarly, CO2 is a warming gas. There's lots and lots of evidence for that. I think one part of the solution is, get to, is to help people realize the difference between, <clears throat> excuse me, um, science and opinions that can be informed by science. Go ahead and debate opinions. That's great. Uh, in the schools, um, but in a science classroom, you shouldn't be debating whether the earth goes around the sun or the sun goes around the earth. You shouldn't be de debating whether living things have common ancestors. Debate the consequences, debate whether this is good or bad, but let's, let's leave the science alone in an educational setting. And I don't think this is as hard as, as one might think immediately because, as I mentioned before, Americans have a very positive attitude toward science. But ultimately, our task is not primarily about the science. The, primarily isn't the, the problem isn't primarily science deficit or knowledge deficit. The, pri the problem is that people have their fingers jammed into their ears and they're not listening. And what keeps the fingers jammed in the ears is the belief that something very important is going to be lost if the other guy is right. To anti-evolutionists, if evolution is true, the consequences are stupendous. They believe they have to give up their belief in God and the truth of the Bible, which means the loss of salvation, the loss of a center for morality and behavior, loss of friends and social support. These are very, very important issues to conservative Christians. And I can understand why they would be very upset to have their kids taught evolution in their public schools. These concerns need to be assuaged because by and large, I've talked to enough teachers. This is not what is being taught in the public schools. This is not a worry that they should have. For climate change contrarians, climate change alarmists like me will weaken the economy, they'll increase the, the control of central government, they'll endanger natural, national security, uh, they will require compromises in individual liberty. These are all very important issues for political conservatives who feel very strongly about these values. And if indeed cli anthropogenic climate change is taking place, then we're gonna have to put some constraints on the um, carbon producing industries, which is an attack on capitalism, you can see how there's a whole cascade of things that attack their values. So they're not gonna be very happy with the idea that climate change is real. Values, ideology, and group identification variables are essential to consider in addition to the science. The science is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Communication research has suggested that changing minds requires simple, effective messages, and there's a lot of research on what those messages would be depending on the subject. They'll be different for evolution than for climate change or vaccination, obviously. I did a radio program in um, Canada a couple of years ago. The community was having a, um, a problem with, uh, th there was a little um, measles flare-up. Uh, there was an anti-vaccination group in town that were 
persuading people not to get their kids vaccinated, and so there was this real you know, burst of, of measles. And the host, it was really interesting, the host was giving as one of the reasons why people should get uh, vaccinated is herd immunity, you know, the idea that a high percentage, 95% uh, of people need to be vaccinated so that everybody can be safe. And I had to kind of chuckle inwardly because I can see that argument working in Canada. I'm not so sure that herd immunity is going to be that effective in the United States because we ain't Canadians, all right? So different audiences, different arguments for different, um, for different topics. But simple, effective messages is the first step. California had a very effective program to discourage smoking from the 1990s until the early 2000s. The messages were simple, the tobacco industry lies, nicotine is addictive, secondhand smoke kills. Um, they were simple, they were repeated often. Effective messages for communicating evolution have been developed over the years by my former organization. They counter the main contentions of creationists, what we've called the pillars of creationism. First is that evolution is bad science. Well, the counter to that is evolution is good science. You have to choose between evolution and Christianity. No, you don't. There are plenty of examples of people who have managed to do that, to accommodate science to their religious views just fine. And the idea that both creation and evolution should be taught out of a sense of fairness, well, that simply is not good pedagogy whatsoever. It is teaching both is not fair to students. You should not miseducate students. So simple effective messages is the first communication strategy from a trusted messenger. Now, the most trusted messengers are those most like the listener, someone who has the same values and concerns, a member of the same tribe. A friend of mine told me he got into discussion with um, another person about GMOs, and they weren't getting any place. One was for, one was against. They were butting heads. And finally, the guy my friend was talking about said, oh, you libertarians are all alike. He said, libertarian? I'm not a libertarian. I'm a socialist. And the, the fellow he was talking to was just stunned, and all of a sudden he started listening. <laughs> my friend described it as, because I was like him, Maybe I was saying something that should be listened to. Evangelical Christians who accept evolution like Dennis Lamoureux and Glenn Morton and pretty much anybody from the website BioLogos are very important messengers to the evangelical Christian community. Similarly, Republicans and other political conservatives who accept anthropogenic global warming are extremely important messages, messengers to the conservative political community. Finally, communication specialists tell us that messages need to be re repeated often before they are absorbed. I often remind my friends and my uh, uh, co-workers at NCSC that nobody ever got their mind changed in one pass. The best you can hope to do if you're having a conversation with somebody whose opinion you're trying to change is to just crack that door a little bit. And maybe the next time that person hears similar arguments, the door will be cracked a little bit further, and maybe a little bit further, and sooner or later, that person can walk through the door. This does not seem to be understood whatsoever online. <laughs> <laughs> there is, in fact, uh, evidence, there's research showing that an idea such as the lack of weapons of mass destructions in Iraq, for example, that is repeated very often in the news eventually gets accepted, or at least more people will accept that. You know who's really good at repeating something often? <laughs> in fact, he's really good at all three of these. Simple, effective messages, his supporters consider him very, very trusted, very trustworthy, and no collusion, no collusion, no collusion, no Com constant repetition, very, very effective communication strategy. So what does research tell us about knowledge resistance? Well, we know there are some ideas we can change our minds about and others that we have problems with. It's mostly the ideas themselves 
you can change your mind about how photosynthesis works or that we use 10% of our brain because these ideas don't challenge our ideologies, our values, or our group identification. We know that people are reluctant to <clears throat> change their minds for many reasons and it's not stupidity, ignorance, or rejection of science. It's not that people ignore the science, Americans like science, and there's plenty of evidence that information can change minds. It's not all the backfire effect. It's just that ideology values and how people identify with other comes first. That's what puts the fingers in the ears. And you've got to deal with these other issues before the fingers come out of the ears and the science has a chance to make a difference. And finally, we need to consider communication strategies that have been shown to work to help us do a better job. Here's my low-tech suggestion. People have to talk to one another. We need to build up relationships of trust with people we disagree with, which requires mutual respect. Trusted messengers are listened to, and most trusted are the people from the same tribe. But even if you're from a different tribe, you can build up a relationship of trust. I'm a humanist, but I have many friends among the evangelical Christian community that I get along with very well. We trust each other, we respect each other, we share views. Um, mutual respect occurs when people get to know one another as individuals rather than as symbols. If you can establish trustful relationships, then there is a possibility that you can move forward. The science then has a chance to be listened to. The fingers come out of the ears. And we who love science have a confidence that the science can make a difference, if only it can be listened to. But it can't be listened to if values, ideologies, and group identification keep the fingers jammed into the ears. You can find out more about that at ncse.com. And thanks very much for coming to hear me tonight. And we have time for a couple of questions, and if you raise your hand, we'll bring a mic over. First of all, I would like to mention that I'm a member of your tribe. I have a master's <laughs> in mathematics, I uh, studied science and uh, sociology, I have my own startup in this city, so... Um, do you believe in God or any kind of spirituality? Nope. Um, <laughs> do you... That's, that's hardly an applause line, that's just an opinion. <laughs> that's just an opinion, yes. Um, I suggest you have a positive and not negative discourse about creationism when... I'm sorry, um, say that again, please. You, you, you could. Oh, I can talk about creationism for, for many, a long time. That's kind of and, my bread and, and butter for a long non time. Non-believers in science is not the same thing as crea creationists. Oh yeah, creationists uh, love naming science. Naming it properly is, is, is important in your discourse. It's preventing you from... Uh, it's preventing your message from reaching people who believe in creationism or spirituality. Well, as I say, I get along pretty well with people in the religious community. Um, mainstream Christians particularly, mainstream Protestants and Catholics have been my best allies in terms of trying to keep evolution in the public schools. So I'm happy with these folks. She has the microphone up there. It's being taped, so that's why she's passing the mic around. It seems like for the uh, communication strategies uh, from the communication research, um, both sides of a debate could potentially, you know, produce simple messages delivered by trusted people repeated often. Yep. So is there anything about the side with more facts that um, gives them an advantage in using those strategies? Or, you know, if vaxxers and anti-vaxxers both have the same strategies, is it still kind of you know, tools in the battle on equal ground. In a, in a short talk, although I think I went longer than they expected, <clears throat> sorry about that. Uh, in a short talk, I wasn't able to get into some of the other details, but you are absolutely correct, and I'm glad to have an opportunity to go a little bit further. Um, it's not just the strategies, it's what you talk about. So if you are dealing with an anti-vaxxer, the single most important issue to and somebody who doesn't want to vaccinate their child is their child's safety. Their 
mostly worried that the, their precious child is going to somehow be hurt by this medicine that um, they're being forced to use. Um, you need to assuage that concern. Um, just like you need to assuage the concern of a conservative Christian that it's a choice between evolution and religion. Um, there are people who accommodate, so go talk to them. But, um, you know, GMOs, the issue is often purity. Uh, the issue is, is often a feeling that uh, somehow we are, we are messing around with something that is quite sacred uh, by inserting genes into other creatures uh, and that this is, this is fundamentally wrong. Well, come up with some examples, and there are plenty of examples, of the use of GMO technology to actually improve the life of animals. That GMOs, uh, GMO technology, CRISPR technology, CRISPR-ish technologies have been used to produce polled cattle rather than very painfully cutting off the horns of a young uh, calf to make a pulled cow. You can just insert the gene that makes them naturally not grow horns. That's great. So, you know, yes, the strategies are the same, but it's the content that's going to have to be thought through. Yes. And we only have a limited time, so right. Jeannie, I think, will be around, but we do want to let right. some other folks ask. Thanks for a great talk. Well, you're welcome. Thanks um, for inviting me. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know what the backfire effect is. The backfire effect is the idea that when you present information to people, it just hardens their views. So if you present information on climate change, say, you just make the climate change contrarian harder in their views. It's much more subtle than that. Um, what tends to be the case with the work done with anti-vaxxers, for example, is the really extreme anti-vaxxers dig in their heels. The people who are just kind of, eh, I don't really, I'm kind of worried, I'm, I don't want to vaccinate my kid, you give them the proper information from a trusted source like physicians or other parents, they're willing to change their mind. So it's not every bit of, of um, information makes people dig in their heels harder. Uh, it kind of depends on how far you are down the line. Okay. <laughs> in other si societies uh, which score high on the UN's uh, Human Development Index, there's uh, virtually and no disagreement over uh, issues such as evolution or climate change, regardless of ideology. Can conservatives in Britain or France accept uh, climate change just as much as the people on the left of the spectrum? Is there any reason why Americans are particularly uh, more polarized? I'm not an expert on why Americans have such a high percentage rejecting uh, global warming, climate change. Although notice that the more recent data is converging more toward that of Europe, more Americans are accepting, global, uh, accepting climate change and even anthropogenic climate change, so it's getting better. With evolution, I think the, I actually wrote an article on that because it's the second most common question I'm asked. Why is this happening here? Uh, and it, like everything else, it's history and culture. We have a very decentralized education system. We have decentralized religion system. Uh, we don't have a national religion, so it's, uh, you know, invent your own. Uh, and the United States has been the homeland of all kinds of new religions, like the Mormons and the Seventh-day Adventists and the Christian scientists, and just, you can tick them off. Um, they didn't arise in Germany or France, where there's a state religion. They arose in the United States, where anything goes. <laughs> So, pardon? I, I stand corrected. You are absolutely correct. At one point there was in the, in the 1800s, but there you go. <laughs> and we right. only have time for one more public question. I know there are lots remaining, and we apologize we can't accommodate them all publicly. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask, what do you do when there is a dearth of research into something because of ideological reasons, but the impact of people's ideologies are really having a detrimental impact on people's human rights? That's a very interesting question. I don't know the answer to it. Um, research, it all depends. I mean, research generally costs money, um, even if it's, I mean, social science research also costs money. You have travel expenses, you have um, 
you know, interviewing expenses, you know, there, there are various things. Um, I think there are a lot of, of serious problems in society that should be studied and there is not support for it and I don't know the answer for it. Try to raise the money from uh, private sources. Wouldn't be the first crowdfunder. <laughs> anyway, enjoy the Exploratorium. This is a wonderful place and join. It's a really good organization. And thank you again to Jeannie. Uh, and also at 8.30, we're excited to have Rachel Thomas here presenting disinformation, the threat we face is bigger than fake news. And that's only about 10 minutes away. So if you yes. plan on watching that, you can stay in here or head out and enjoy the museum.